Welcome, travelers. We're aware that your journey was difficult, but prepare to have your questions answered, for you have been granted an audience with the Masters of Moth. Boom. All right. That was such good shout outs that we that so many things that are dope. Cool. Make sure to hit the bell to hit that subscribe rate right there. Yes, sir. The subscribe and the bell. There's two buttons. The bell lets you know when me and Ben are live streaming. All, All right. right. First card. And we and some of these cards will hark back to conversations we've had in previous episodes. So we'll kind of throw you back to those. So the first one is Cloud Shredder Sliver. But we had a whole sliver conversation. Cloud Thresher. When we talked to... Cloud Shredder Sliver. Cloud Shredder. It's the white it's red one. White red sliver. Sliver creatures you control have flying in haste. It's a 1-1. One, one. Already seen play in Sliver's decks. Sliver decks are currently not making the waves that any deck can make because Hogak is 50% of the format. I think this um, card is the best sliver in the new set. I it's, think the Unearthed one is better. Is it? Okay. I, I think they're comparable, though. I think those are the two to really look at. Unearthed lets them become more combo heavy and because it's so much more resilience. Cloud Shredder Sliver is just generically the most pound for pound power. So it's like it's, together, that's a really powerful two cards. It's really good. In Limited that I played this card, I actually have been very impressed with just it's just generally pretty strong. Yep. It works with all the changelings in the set and like this card's cool. Um, so yeah, so, but for a full sliver conversation, go back to the black, uh, card review. Cause we started talking about the unearthed one there and then we went on a whole sliver conversation. Gotcha. Um, next card. And this one's more, more de definitely think format changing is Eldamri's El Eldamri's call. Eldamri. El El Eldamri's right? call. Yeah, yeah. Green and white instant search your library for a creature card, reveal that card, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Um, this is just one of the better creature tutors now in the format. I mean, the, like there's, I see a ton of decks being played. I've seen the. The Kirin slash Ugin's Conjurant decks playing yeah. this card to be able to find the pieces you need. I've seen combo decks. I've seen elves decks. Like this is this alongside the new uh, green finale right. together have kind of given a whole new green tutor suite to the whole world of green decks that are out there. Yeah. So originally printed in Plane Shift, which I think was released in like 2001 or something like that, or mm -hmm. like 2000. I mean, this card is old. This card is the, it's the oldest most powerful creature tutor that was always deemed sort of just fair enough to play. Like, right. You know, to form Alec Highlander, this is a card that usually is in most people's wheels, but like wasn't like just a staple. Like mm -hmm. I didn't play it for a long time, mm -hmm. but it's really good. It's an instant speed, two mana tutor gets you any creature into your hand as opposed to in play, which, you know, some of the, the like green sun or stuff like that. It's not quite as efficient, but for its cost, it is pretty darn good. And, and there's well, a lot an you can speed. do with it. Being instant speed is a huge game and it's in your hand on top of your deck. Like, I mean, instant speed demonic tutor in the decks that are taking advantage of this is an insanely powerful card. Uh, I'm super excited to see what also, it does in the format. Also, a two-mana instant that pairs with a card I like to call Isaac Run Scepter. Just saying, guys. You know what we have next? It's also a two-mana instant mm. that doesn't pair well with Isaac Run Scepter. It's Ice Fang Kotal, green and a blue. Snow Creature, Snake, Flash Flying. When Ice Fang Kotal enters the battlefield, draw a card. Ice Fang Kotal has Death Touch. As long as you control at least three other snow permanents, it's a 1-1. One, one. So this is the Baleful Strix that they ended up giving us. And, and we, you lose... Guaranteed Death Touch for Flash, which I don't necessarily think is a downgrade because um, you still get really Death Touch, good. especially if you make the Snow Permanent feature work. And we talked about last episode how the new uh, uh, rare Terramorphic Expanse kind of allows those Snow decks to function with this card. Right. Um, and there are now a ton of Snow decks out there that are doing a lot of cool stuff. This is, yeah, it's showing up in the snow decks. I think it's showing up in the ninja deck as well because yep. it's, you know, it's blue and so you can exile to Force of Negation, but you also can return it to your hand with any of the ninjutsu effects. Um, I built, so I built a deck that I actually talked about last week on the stream. And if you guys want to hear a full conversation about it, it's a, it's my own version sort of of like a blue tempo deck. And it's this like fairy miscreant, spell slutter sprite with aether vial and Force of Negation. And you're trying to draw lots mm -hmm. of cards with Curious Obsession. It's, it's a riff on mono blue tempo from standard, but in modern using fairy. Because I didn't go, I didn't put this in the deck because it's not a fairy. But it's this card was the thing that kind of got me the inspiration for I would like to build something mm -hmm. like this in modern. And I do think right in that same exact category of all your all of your like flash claim fame tempo y sort of value at two mana and less things you want to do in modern, this card is perfect for that stuff. And you can do a lot of very cool things with it. Because it replaces itself with the draw card and at instant speed. So at the end of your opponent's turn, you flash it in, and then for the rest of the game you just can hit them with it. And eventually it's gonna do enough damage that it was worth it and or they're going to have to deal with it by spending a, like a one mana card to deal with it. So yep. you've now up a card two for one them 
or one yeah two for one them yeah um and put them in a situation where they've taken some damage because there's like dumb one one flyer was hitting them and eventually it gets death touch once you play enough stone lands in the late game and they have like a tarmogoy for anything that's attacking and you're like you can't attack me because i have this one one death touch now that did five damage to you and drew me a card on turn one i think one of the cooler things two. about this card too and we actually i haven't even looked into this so i don't even know if this is a thing yet but one of the things horizons did such a good job of it sort of being time spiral too is took a lot of concepts from old sets and gave us a new piece that might tie them together and snakes back from kamigawa mm -hmm. was a cool thing it was one of the parts of kamigawa snow snakes that, well the, uh, the 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 what's the snake the snow snake from yeah, oran viper oran viper the last thing is this is the second best blue green like it's interesting how we did our best blue green cards right after uh ravnica allegiance yeah and then they're like they're all bad like it was still like we did the all 10 you know which like they're not slippery not good. and then like blue green came back and was like well here's hydroid crisis neoform <laughs> and here's ice wing Codal. and then now i think it's a i think one of the i think i think neoform is the best blue green card in modern but i think ice wing Codal is second easy and i i don't know where we both put hydroid crisis but it's absolutely we, dominated standard for the last few we, months we it was released when we did the when we did the top 10 blue green cards we, it wasn't released but when we did the best card of each color combo yeah 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 it was a bit we talked about it then. Yeah, 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 yeah yeah it's really good <laughs> It's really good. Um, all right, next card, Munitions Expert. Right in a black goblin flash. When Munitions Expert enters the battlefield, you may have it deal damage to target creature or planeswalker equal to the number of goblins you control. It's a 1-1. One, one. So the one thing that this is harking back to is Gem, gem Palm... Incinerator? Incinerator. Yeah. Um, now this, instead of having to cycle it and draw a card, you just get a 1-1 one, one creature with flash. Um, and so comparable, would you say a 1-1 one, one goblin? That adds to the pip that needed to be able, or adds to the the count is better than gem palm incinerator. Well, it's an instant, and it's black red versus mono red. Yeah, I, I think this card is good. This card is especially good in limited, uh, more than it is probably necessarily in modern. I think it's powerful, and I think there are some very cool things this card does. I don't. This doesn't make me feel like okay, this is gonna. You don't think you don't think the like goblin matron goblin decks aren't gonna try and play this card. Maybe. I mean, probably, yes. I just this. I don't look at this card and go, oh, this is going to make that deck X times more powerful. I think it's like, this is a card I would consider playing in that deck. Sure. There's enough good cards in that deck already that I don't know if this makes it. Is this card good enough? Is this card good enough to push you into black? That's kind of, yeah. There's a lot of good goblins. There's a lot now. I don't know if this does for me. Okay. It's right on the edge. How about you? Uh, I think this, and there's one other, I think, that would put me closer to black. The Siege Gang Commander. Or not Siege Gang. Siege Gang Launcher. The, the new black one. one. The new four? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think those two together. Put, I think if I'm in black for that, I think this card definitely is something to consider. Right. Especially like as at worst a sideboard card against any deck playing any of the 10 powerful Planeswalkers because this hits Planeswalkers and being able to get rid of them in a Goblins deck is relevant. Fair. Without having to like lose an attack step, right? Ruination Rider, red, green, human berserker. When Ruination Rider dies, you may have it deal damage to any target equal to the number of land cards in your graveyard. Um... I think this is just the best way to take lands in your graveyard quantities and do direct damage. Like, I don't think there's a way to just pretty, fire pretty something. Powerful. And it's a 2-2 two, two for 2 that's, like, relatively aggressive. And then once it's in play, it's so hard to block this guy because as soon as he dies, as long as I've fetched twice, at worst, it's a shock. Right. And then in any deck that's trying to take advantage of it, that scales up real quick. I think that if Dread Return or some effect from your graveyard where you could resurrect something was legal, maybe there would be a just straight up mill your entire deck and this thing just ends the game. Sure. Right, right off the bat that would come to mind. But I'm sure there is some version of a deck that's going to do exactly something like that. Yeah. And it's, you know, Countryside Crusher in this card. Like, there's a bunch of... Yeah, I think this is better than Countryside Crusher will ever be. In yeah. Mind. I like I I don't know if I'm playing Countryside Crusher, but if I ever did, I would consider this card first. Yeah. I mean, again, like, they've just pushed... They just pushed a lot of these things to cost two mana. Right. And now when something costs two, it hits that bill in modern of like, all right, I can build around this because turn two is my setup turn. Like turn two is where I need to be doing something impactful. Right. Like I can just put this into play early. And then for the rest of the game, it's just a thing that exists. And my opponent either has to worry that I'm going to seismic assault it to kill them or I'm going to attack them with it and they can't block it. Because if, if they block it, they take 10 damage to the face. Like it's such a, a like a trap for your opponent, that I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, Unsettled Mariner, white, blue, shapeshifter, changeling. Whenever you are a permanent you control, becomes the target of a spell or ability and opponent controls. Counter that spell or an ability unless its controller pays one. This is the best Eldrazi in Modern Horizons. Also the best... Uh, Oof. No, it's not the best oof. There's that there's the Stony Silence one. There's the spell wild oof, you mean? What's, the, what's like <laughs> a weird tribe? Best Mur. It's the best Mur in the format. 
Yeah, this card's <laughs> well. This card's really interesting. So again, in that blue deck that I mentioned, the the fairies one, I actually ended up uh, playing a little bit of white so that I could have access to two of these. Sure. Um, I well, mean, so this like, is the the thing that's cool about this card is just like every tribe can now consider this. It's a humans card. It's an elf card. It's a fairies card. It's a merfo card. Spirits it's card. a spirits card. It's a like we were talking about um, slivers the other week, and we were talking about this card being a part of that deck because it's so powerful as an introduction. And then there's a bunch of tribes out there that like need a little bit of help. And this is a reason to be in a tribe with this card. Yeah. I mean, this card is really good. They, again, the rates pushed, it costs two. it, the fact that you can slot this into any one of your cool decks, that's trying to do something a little bit wacky or off the rails and needs a little bit of time to set up just to slow your opponent down. We've all seen how good Thalia is and effectively this kind of Thalia is for, for your deck. It's not quite a Thalia, but it does allow it. Thalia is for you. If they're trying to disrupt what you're doing, that's not intrinsically as powerful as like a human's deck. The issue is this is also a human. So it just makes humans that much better also. Sure. But it's a little bit more redundant in humans where like other decks that didn't have access to protection for their creatures yeah. or you were, or, or attacks effects against people's spells were looking for that effect. Um, do, you, do you think that this uh, would suggest you might want to play a little more white in your merfolk deck? I know like that's a thing people have tried in the past. Obviously the blue white yeah. Sig is a decent card and um, there are some other kind of cool There's a white, white lord, right? There's a white that's merfolk th- lord. That's the Sig I was yeah, thinking yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this card makes me think, okay, like now you've now you've pushed me a little more into white. This fits really nicely into my, you know, two CMC Aether Vial plan that I get with all my lords. It, you know, it has the curse catcher effect, except that it's a bear that affects the board without having to sacrifice it. Sure. So I think it's pretty good. I, I think it's going to see play in a lot of decks in modern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next card is Ren and Six, red, green, legendary planeswalker Ren. It's a three, three, uh, convert or three loyalty plus one return up to one target land card from your graveyard to your hand. Minus one Ren and Six deals one damage to any target. Minus seven, you get an emblem with instance and sorcery cards. You're in your graveyard have retrace, which means that you can discard a land card from your hand to cast that spell from your graveyard, um, for its converted mana cost. Uh, this is already jumped up. I mean, uh, I think it's gone down a little bit, and part of that is just the format shaking out to not have this lands deck out there. But I think this is a pretty powerful consideration always for these lands decks that we've mentioned. It's the a bunch. second actual legitimate two mana planeswalker, or were there a bunch in War of the Spark that I'm forgetting? Uh, War of the Spark had no two mana ones. Right? The only other two mana one is uh, Jace Fringe Prodigy. That's what I'm saying, but actual, like it comes down as a planeswalker. Yeah, yeah, just it's the this second and one this, ever. And this one is a good one versus. Well, they learned Tibalt. something. Yeah, this card. This card makes me think two things. The first thought I have. They are never going to print Wasteland into Modern. This card should be a pretty good indicator of the fact that they are never going to print yes, Wasteland into absolutely. Modern. absolutely. If they could never have printed this card, if they had some intention of putting an actual hard LD spell, mm-hmm. like, a, like an LD land with this is a nightmare. We've been talking about this because every single player in Highlander Gauntlet has some three-color lands deck sure. that plays all of the lands and all of the Sylvan Scryings and right. things. And this... And a strip mine in your opening hand is the most unfun thing that's ever happened. Right. Your opponent just looks at you and like, really, bro? Really? Well, and what's cool about this card is I've already been seeing people add it to their Jun decks, seeing it add into their, you know, if they're playing Naya decks, I guess that's a thing that could happen. But, you know, the fact that this, like, in many ways, plus ones to draw you a card in Modern because you have fetch lands, I was already running with a single life from the Loam and Jun just because getting extra lands to discard to Liliana the Veil, getting extra lands to just keep, you know, making sure I'm hitting my land drops every turn. And then I, like, added one cycle land and, and I had uh, Traverse, not Traverse. The green landfall get clue tokens. For Tyler's tracker. Tyler's tracker. I had, I had two Tyler's tracker in there, so it made sure I kept hitting the clues off of my fetch lands. Um, this card's really good in that. Like it fits kind of in the similar spot as the Bob or the Dark Confidant slot, and it allows you to cut Dark Confidants that are medium right now, or like the draw effect on them is you know the life total hit is a little too harsh. I like that. Um, I really like that the minus ability is direct damage to any target, not to a mm-hmm. creature. Or, or like a creature or planeswalker would made this a little bit less appealing. Sure. The fact that it is this can this can function as kind of a mini engine for you in the late game to just start closing the game out a little bit at a time if you needed to. Yeah, like get a land, do a damage. Get yeah, a land, get a land do, do a, a damage. damage. And I think also the fact that we now have the cycle lands, all the cycle lands are now going to be in modern. The one mana cycle lands sure. just is like they're They've just pushed the power level. Do you feel like in the last three months, Modern's power level has jumped like 20%? Uh, I think this is the fastest format in modern Magic history. Yeah. Like I, right now, I think like someone posted this earlier that this is a turn six format in the sense that each player gets six turns and then the game is over. Right. And the sense that like, and that's faster than Vintage has ever really been. That's faster than uh, Legacy has ever really been. And I think that that's like one thing that is when we 
this last weekend and or next weekend, depending on if you're the future or us now, uh, why we're going to be talking about kind of a banless conversation because the power level of modern is so high and like cards like this were added that are really high power level, but aren't doing anything yet. And that's something they really pay attention to. Right. Um, next is etchings of the chosen one black white enchantment as etching of the chosen enters the battlefield, choose a creature type creatures you control of the chosen type gets plus one plus one. You may sacrifice a creature of the chosen type target creature you control gains indestructible until in a turn. This card, we don't have to say too much about this. It adds a couple things. Um, anytime you give me a card that allows, you know, adaptive automaton, a metallic mimic, like mm -hmm. anything that where it comes down and affects lots of tribes, I'm interested because it just sure. there's there's a glue that adds ideas together. Yep. And the fact that on top of that, it's black and it has a sacrifice ability built into the card means that it's going to play with zombies well. It's going to play with a vampire deck that wants to sack Ooh, creatures. Right, right. It's going to play with any kind of any kind of tribal card that wants you to sack creatures. Um, and that's cool. I think it's a cool uh, uh, card just for aristocrat decks because they both make tokens, so the creature bonus could just choose the token type you're making or the creatures that you have if you're more vampire-leaning. I agree. Uh, next card is Good Fortune Unicorn, one green white. Creature Unicorn, it's a 2-2. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may put a plus one, plus one counter on that creature. Uh, there's two conversations with this. One is it just it's another thing like Malira or Vizier that goes infinite with Kitchen Finks or uh, right. any of the Persist creatures. So if you're going to try to go with the whole... Well, actually, it doesn't work with Pod because Pod's gone. So if you were going to try to have something in a different CMC effectively... Sure. Just yeah, that you, wanted yeah to. you want to go to the three mana versus two mana. I don't think there is a three mana card that does it. So this gets you the three mana CMC needed to be able to do that. Um, more importantly... There aren't enough unicorns in Magic. I'm going to go on this rant right now. The fact that it is like the premier fantasy creature in pop culture. Literally, we sell a collectible series of these squishy characters as a toy company. And one of the six characters that we have at Walmart right now is a unicorn. And it's outselling the next one four to one. <laughs> um, and as Magic especially is trying to become a little bit more uh, appealing to women and yep. especially kid this is a kids game and it's intent like yeah. the amount of little sisters i know in the world that have a brother that played magic that like their entire experience with magic is like oh i want all of the unicorn cards and there's Angels two of unicorns. them yeah and so let's get more unicorns in the game these could be legendary there's not a legendary unicorn there's no unicorn tribal i know right i'm waiting for there there need there needs to be a commander unicorn printed in the next right. commander set like i i i think it is yeah, what's it's, the third, it's, it's what's laughable. The, what's the third color on your unicorn? Green, white make perfect sense. Why does it have to be three colors? I'm just imagining a lot of the sweet commanders blue they print. Blue or red? Yeah, blue probably. A bant unicorn makes sense. Bant unicorn makes sense. So kind does of, a naya unicorn. Kind of fiery unicorn. Yeah. They're powerful. Yeah. Cool. Like a ponita. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what a ponita is? That's a, that's a Pokemon. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Proud of you. I collected the cards. Okay. Kaya's Guile, one black, white, instant, choose two. Each opponent sacrifices a creature. Exile all cards from each opponent's graveyard. Create a one, one white and black spirit creature token with flying. You gain four life. You can entwine three to choose all of them. For six mana, you get all of those effects. For three mana, you get two of them. Uh, this card's really powerful. I've already seen it in a bunch of cyborg cards. It's just any time you have a card that reads, do a bunch of things. Yeah. That's good. I want all the Guiles now. I want like each planeswalker to have in the guile. game watch to have a guile with four modes like I mean, uh jace's guile chandra's guile this obviously relates most uh familiarly to Kologon's command it's the card that it feels the most like yes um at three cmc in black and a bunch of kind of relevant modern effective abilities it's a little less good than that card it, it's just like a does well you don't you don't have the looping effect that yeah. uh Kologon's command can do by rebuying snapcaster mages or uh, you know other creatures but but yeah, I mean, it's an instant speed. This is an instant speed edict, which which is strong. Those are always strong. Mm -hmm. um, it's an instant speed make a blocker, which is strong. The fact that it gains four life means that it is scalably better. Half of this card is scalably better than 80% of the cards in burn or any sure. kind of a burn deck that are going to try to one like, man at a three you. This rough is rough for burn because like you play this and you get rid of their goblin guy and gain four life or you create a blocker and you gain four life is like... Just on its own, just a, a beating. Yeah, um, for sure. The rate's really and, good. And we say it on this podcast pretty much every episode, but you have 15 cards in your sideboard, and whenever a card and a sideboard card you put in your card can be good against multiple decks, it stretches your sideboard in a way that's very powerful, and this card is good against three different matchups and worth playing. This in response to them trying to get back, let's just say, two Phoenixes on their big Phoenix sure. turn. You exile their yard in response to the trigger and gain four life is like, 
Okay, so now you have to recover and you have to burn me out with two more cards or find the phoenixes because right. or or like they play their you know their non phoenix card like wall yeah uh, or uh, thing in the ice or or, or crackling drake or crackling making, drake making them sack their crackling drake is very strong yes yeah, they sack it they lose all the cards in their graveyard this card's really good um lava belly sliver this is sliver creatures you control of when this creature enters the battlefield it deals one damage to target player and or planeswalker and you gain one life one red white it's a two two. We talked about this with the Unearthed card. That's part of that Unearthed kind of cycle where you have this, that, and the sacrifice to make two black mana. So you kind of go infinite with those three. Yeah, I, would salt just, I, would, I would just go listen to the Slivers episode. Yeah. We, we talked a lot about Slivers already. Uh, Lightning Skeletal. Black, red, red. Elemental Skeleton. Trample Haste. When it deals combat damage to a player, that player discards two cards. And at the beginning of the end step, you have to sacrifice it. It's a 6-1. So Ball Lightning Blightning. <laughs> ball, ball lightning. blightning yeah uh which i'm assuming that this was called ball blightning they were all play testing and then Probably. they came up with a sillier name because they wanted to keep the name um i've seen a bunch of people trying this in gen list i've because like just getting this off of a blood braid elf is an insane crazy value cra- crazy value moment for them um yeah I mean, it's hard. that that's that's the fun history of magic throwback to like you used to get a blightning off your blood braid elf now you get a blightning and uh well and, like you can like you say you hit them for three yeah. Like that's one more card than Blightning was hitting them for, and then every damage above that. Plus, you killed a creature because they had a chump lock. If plus, you like turn two. If you like, I mean, yeah, and just hitting this one turn three, like strong. No, it's totally yeah, strong, especially in a format that like because of the new Mulligan rule and because of the new Horizon lands, life totals have now been lowered almost to twelve versus fifteen, which were there where they were like. Hitting someone for six, this is half their life total if they've fetched lands and casted a card. Yeah, I think another thing that's really cool about this card, and I've, I've said this a couple times now, but we're seeing it in the M20 previews a lot. They are continuing to push elementals as a creature type. Mm-hmm. They're continuing to give us more and more interesting creatures that are elementals. And right now, because of Unclaimed Territory, Primal Beyond, and Cavern of Souls, you have 12 five-color lands. Casting this in a deck with any other colored elemental, you don't care. You're yeah. completely fine. You're yeah, going to hit yeah, this yeah. on turn three in that deck almost every single time. Because red is also your base color, right? So black is just a splash. Like, it's aggressive. There's a lot of cool elemental Did stuff. you see wet Omnath? No. There's a third Omnath card. Is it good? He's, like, reaching close to div visit levels of number of printings. He's oh one behind. God. Uh Next card is it's it's fine. I don't know if it's modern playable. It's just it's I love that he keeps adding colors as he grows. I'm I'm hoping we get a five color Omnath because that's the other like yeah. el, like elementals are a five color tribe. I think we can talk about this for under a minute, and I think there's only a couple things to say about it. Whenever, okay, uh, Soul Herder one blue white. Whenever a creature is exiled the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on Soul Herder at the beginning of your unstep. You may exile another target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. It's a one one. So what's cool about it, and the reason we just we'll talk about it really briefly, mm-hmm. is. Blink effects have always been, like, cool. That's, like, always a thing in modern that we've liked. Um, Venser is one of your favorite cards ever. Uh, sure. Blue-white Planeswalker Venser. Yeah. And anytime they've tried to put this sort of effect repeatedly on a card, it has to cost, like, four, five, six mana. So Conjurer's Closet, Venser, cards like that. The fact that this is three and gets something to turn that it comes down in blue-white, which is classically the blink colors, does mean that if you protect this card the right way, if you go about it like you like clear their hand or you're playing this in, you know, maybe Esper, so you've, you've thought sees them in an earlier turn, mm-hmm. you can start to set up some pretty de- degenerate stuff. You know, like Stoneheart, Stoneheart, Dignitary. Stoneheart, Dignitary. I mean, your you new have... card, our 2 1 that we just talked about, the yeah. Hideaway card, but this is really good. Yeah, yeah. The Hideaway card, like getting to top four, put a card into your hand every turn. Right. And every time you do this, gets bigger. Plus, when you path something, this thing is going to get one bigger. It, it's whenever a creature is exiled from the battlefield, right? Yeah, and so it starts getting bigger itself, Yeah, too. So I, I definitely think this card's really cool. And the art's amazing. It's just a 1-1 one, one for 3, unfortunately, yeah. so it makes it hard to imagine seeing a lot of play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, collected Conjuring, 2 blue, red. Sorcery, exile the top 6 cards of your library. You may cast up the sor- 2 sorcery cards with converted mana cost 3 or less from among them without paying their mana cost. Put the exile cards, not cast this way, in the bottom of your library in, in random order. It's sorcery collective company, both in the sense that it finds sorceries and also it is a sorcery and the art is dope and I don't think it's very good. What would you do with this card? I mean, you would do, you would play, what are your like highest impact three CMC sorceries if you were going to max value? Like, uh, I absolutely would not play any three CMC sorceries. I'd find ones that cost nothing and you can only cast if you suspend them. Yeah. So you'd get the two rhinos, new card, you'd get draw three cards after it. Right, you'd try, right, like right. this is a card for... The As Foretold decks is the play I would maybe play it, and I don't think it's better than Electro Dominance, the Red Finale, or As Foretold. Yeah, okay, fair. Maybe as a one of in that deck, maybe. It's it's cool. I like the design. Not really powerful, yep. I don't think. 
Cast Ascendant Mage, best card in Magic. We're done. <laughs> we can finish this review well, now. Well, we did. You guys, if you guys want to hear us talk about Cast Ascendant Mage, we, it was our preview card. It's, so it's just so people don't know, it's red, black, blue, one Cast Ascendant Mage. Its art uh, is great. Legendary creature, human wizard, flying during each of your turns. You may cast an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. If a card cast this, it will be put into your graveyard, exiled instead. It's a 3-4. I've previewed this card now twice. It's the best. I could talk about it forever, but there's a whole episode about it, and we're running out of time a little bit. Uh, it's powerful. I mean, it's powerful. Yeah. It's Snapcaster Mage every turn in Grixis. And just we're done. That's it. We can stop talking about magic ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Fallen Shinobi, three blue black. Zombie Ninja, Ninja do two blue black. Whenever Fallen Shinobi deals combat damage to a player, that player exiles the top two cards of their library until end of turn. You may play those cards without paying their mana cost. It's a five four. So it ninjutsu's in for four mana to deal five damage and then uh, play top two the top two cards of the library of your opponent so that you do damage to that is a pretty huge swing i've already seen i think it was Connolly, but it might have been someone else posted a list of him playing the the codal and other like fairies and the one drop fairy that uh, scries to that was printed to just sneak yep. this guy into play do a ton of damage you get a ton of value for four four mana um i think this like seeing the spoiler i didn't think this card would be doing anything but people are already playing it so it's a really it's big very huge it's a swing. really big swing right because it's it's a four mana dome five draw to and you don't really lose any tempo right. and because it's blue it allows you to play it alongside force of negation um mm -hmm. which is what a lot of people are doing as you're getting these extra cards uh, you are playing your free counter spells. Right. And so that's, I'm actually a little, not, I wouldn't say totally worried, but I'm a little worried now that between this and Disrupting Shoal, we have two free counter spells alongside a whole bunch of sweet new blue cards in Modern that I'm a little concerned the format's going to start to be just like, I, I'm on the other end of that. I, we need that. Like right now, the format's so degenerate on the other end that different ways to stop those things. Like, I, I, while Modern Horizons was being previewed before decks were kind of coming out there, I was definitely like, oh, Force of Negation is definitely good enough. But like at this point, I'm also like, maybe we need that and Force of Will and Disrupting Shoal just to like yeah. be able to fight the format. Um, but this card's really good. Yep. I mean, this, yeah. It's really powerful, yeah. Okay. Uh, Hogak, Arisen Necropolis. Five green, black, green, black. Hybrid. So it's seven mana, two hybrid mana. Legendary Creature Avatar. It's an 8-8. Eight, eight. You can't spend mana to cast this spell. So, delve. <laughs> so this card is super duper interesting. Well, I'm not done reading it yet. There's oh. more cards. It has Convoke and Delve. So each creature you uh, tap while casting the spell for one or one mana of that creature's color. And then each card you exile from your graveyard pays for one mana. So you can tap your creatures and exile cards from your graveyard. You may cast Hogak, the Risen Necropolis, from the, your graveyard. It's a trampling 8-8. Uh, this so card a lot ruining is, modern right now. <laughs> it's not the card though, right? Like it's obviously very powerful and it's very strong, but this plus um, Alter of Dementia, Alter of Dementia plus the fact that the Vengevine deck had, uh, you know, and, and Bridge from Below all together, I think are all all really what's kind of powering it. It's got a bunch of different pieces in the last two years. The other one is the one drop that Mills Three when it dies it enters play. Stitcher Supplier, Stitcher Supplier, which is basically in this deck in many ways a. Um, the thing um and then you have the fact that just this like that deck has a such a consistent turn three win i saw someone mull the three against the deck itself and then win on and turn just three win. yeah this is i mean it's it's super duper interesting um yeah so so for people who don't know what the kind of the combo is 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 the the old dredge vine decks uh or it's now you know just the vengevire stitcher vengevine stitcher supplier you have you know uh Bloodgast, you have the Grave Crawler, just a bunch of different creatures from your graveyard that you can bring into play. Um, and then you're, excuse me, now you get the fact that you're playing um, the artifact. Altar of Dimension. Altar of Dimension to sacrifice them, to mill yourself, to eventually get bridges into your graveyard. So for people to know what that card does, it's a three black mana enchantment that you never want to play. But if it's in your graveyard and a creature dies in Plander you control, you make a 2-2 zombie token. And then if your opponent has a creature that dies under their control, it gets exiled. But so the deck it, allows itself to mill itself out to the point where it has so many of these and so many of these free creatures and so many Hogaks that it can kind of start looping itself to eventually either swing at your opponent with a bunch of 2-2 zombies or just sack them all to mill them to death. Which I think most of the lists are milling them to death. No, you see both. Because like it just generically is attacking with Venge Vines on turn three. Like like you're doing a lot of damage in a format that we just talked about. People are starting at a 14-point life total. Yeah. Being able to swing with like 
three blood gas on turn two and then four like three venge vines on turn three and yeah. then play a hogak is like hard to beat without the mill effect the mill effect is just an inevitability engine eventually they'll win yeah so uh i wish i had his list in front of me because i told him i was going to bring it up on the show but i just just to give a quick shout out um uh, mike ryan something i just don't have it in front of me but uh on the on the stream last night on the the mm cast youtube channel um i deck teched a gentleman's deck you guys can go watch that on the stream from uh it was Thursday night, the 19th, I think, right? Today's the 20th? Mm -hmm. Thursday night, the 19th, I do a whole stream. And in the middle of it, um, this awesome dude, uh, he had me deck tech the deck. And it basically was combining Hollow One with this deck. So it doesn't play the Altar of Dementia package, but it plays the entire, the whole entire base of the Dredgevine deck sure. without bridges and without the Altar. But like it plays Insolent Neonate and all this stuff plus like two Hogax, and it's just like super, super aggressive without the combo win. Sure. Plays 13 lands and four spirit guides. So what's interesting about that is it does make an argument for, you know, what is the broken card, right? Because like if, say they ban Altar, or they ban Bridge, because I think Bridge is the card to ban. And he doesn't play me. either. And he was like, I've he's like, I've top hit a bunch of 100-man events recently locally with this list. Yeah. So it's like, like, so the question is, is like, what's really the problem card? And I think part of the issue, and there's a rant on Twitter that we retweeted today um, from someone that I will look up while I'm talking. But basically the gist of it is that like Wizards has just printed a ton of powerful graveyard interactions. Now on the other end, they've also printed a ton of good ways to interact with the graveyard. Totally. Kyle, Kyle is Guile um, is a great example of that. And just like what where are they looking for the graveyard to be that in modern and, and what do they want is really a big question because like yes faithless looting is making all these decks possible but is it faithless looting or like most of the decks i think are fine without faithless looting well i think yeah and i think the most interesting thing you bring up here is that like all right so if the graveyard is becoming a more and more essential piece of the deck building process for a lot of these decks but between every single color and relic of progenitus and nile spellbomb and leyline and all these things that you can play in any deck now you have tons of ways to interact with the graveyard it was you will rin last of the mardu at the lovely medusa has a really good rant right now we retweeted it she retweeted it on 6 2019 um you can look it up but like because there are so many ways now in every color to interact with the graveyard and so many of these decks are so dependent on their graveyard interaction it does sort of ask the question, if Modern is a three-game format and they've just adjusted this mulligan rule so that in game two, you're going to have a really good shot at drawing your graveyard hate, mm -hmm. I don't know how oppressive graveyard decks will be long-term or if they need to ban something because you just have to build your sideboard correctly so that like you can punish the decks that are relying on their sideboard too completely. Sure. It's, or, or on their graveyard. It's not supposed to be... Your graveyard is not supposed to be your hand. It's supposed to be less good than your hand. It's just there are a lot of things that interact with it in a cool way now. I mean, but like the issue is if all these cards you had to cast out of your graveyard, then I think it would be fine. It's the fact that the way that they made it is that you don't, it doesn't act like your hand. It acts like this other resource where there's just free stuff shows up from and, and being able to kind of deal with that and figure out how Wizards wants to really design philosophy, focus on the graveyard and modern and standard while also creating a format of modern that's healthy. I, it, it's definitely a good question. I, I can see Faithless Looting getting banned just because it's the obvious card, but like Phoenix won't go away that deck will still be good nope uh dredge will still be fine that'll start playing more cathartic reunions and other pieces like the real problem there is the the lightning helix card the free creeping chill yeah creeping chill is really the problem with dredge with the hogak deck like faithless looting is not even an important piece to it like stitcher supplier is and bridge and hogak like so like even if they ban faithless looting that's not even going to touch this deck uh, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on in the graveyard world, and figuring out what's really ha important to get rid of is going to be hard. A hard challenge, and I don't. I don't envy it. And we'll talk a lot about that at GPC Seattle last weekend. <laughs> right. Uh, Mox Tantalite is the next card. Uh, artifacts to spend three uh, zero cost. So it's a Mox for zero, but it takes three turns to add into play. Add one mana of any color. Tap it. So this is. We already had a Black Lotus that did this, and now we have a Mox that does it. Yeah, um, any color Mox. So. so it is worse in one way because that doesn't matter as much. Like be like, why would you play this over the Lotus and most of the decks that are trying to like cheat and rebuy it? Except <laughs> Bolus's Citadel was printed, <laughs> and decks like that that want to cast free cards off the top of their deck for free, and this card's a house in that deck, and I think makes that deck a possibility to be real. Bolus Citadel deck, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, th th totally. This card's interesting. I mean, what, the thing I'll always say is, anytime they print a Mox. Anytime. There's a possibility to break it, even if it takes sure. a little while. So I think long term, you'll see this will be this will be something that you can do cool stuff with. I also think that like 
there there is stuff that I've been like looking at with Goblin Engineer where I'm like I I wonder how much sort of value you can start getting out of a super cheap artifact graveyardy deck where sure. you search and put this into your yard from your engineer on turn two and maybe you have an Arkham's Astrolabe or some other artifact you've already gotten value and you sack it and it accelerates you because it's not going to be a Dark Steel Citadel it's an any color land it, like right. there's there's some pretty cool stuff you can do um, I I think any Mox has the potential to see play sure. So. I don't have that much more to say about Tantalite, but I do think it's cool. I, I, we, so we'll post the list uh, in the Discord, and we'll probably post it in the public facing list section um, of the the what's it called the the Bullets and Citadel list that Cal- Connolly Woods posted online. Yeah, yep. it's really good. Uh, it looks really sweet. Arkham's Astrolabe Lab, Labe. Astrolabe, I think. Astrolabe, uh, one snow mana. That's it. I think this is the only card in the set that does that. Uh, no, no, no. There's a, there's the two two for one snow. Okay. Effect, right. Okay. I don't think we're talking about that. I don't think we will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but one one snow snow artifact when it enters the battlefield, draw a card, uh, tap it, add one mana of any color. I've also seen this card in a lot of places. Uh, you 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 have to tap sink one into it to add one mana. Yeah, yeah. It, it fixes the mana to whatever color you need it to be. Well, I think one of the reasons you're seeing a lot of is that ability allows these snow mana bases that don't get to take advantage of fetches to be able to play the game. This is it. this is prophetic prism for one snow, correct? Isn't that the same card? Yes. Right? Yeah. So prophetic prism classically is too expensive to play in modern, but, but it it's like is close. It's like a very cool card that you've always people are always like, oh yeah, yeah. I mean like it's it's solid. It mm-hmm. like fixes you into like a weird multicolor mana base, but it also draws you a card. It's repeatable. You can blink it. You can get it back from your yard. Well, part of the reason is that the mana base in Modern is pretty clean, and so you don't really need that type of fixing available. And if you need the extra artifact, there's just, once you get to two mana, better things to be casting there that do more powerful things. Now, at one mana, and with words on it that specifically lead you to playing a deck that doesn't have great mana, this is like a format staple. So the the, the card that I look at this, and I think, and I don't think this would work in it, but you remember at, yeah, totally. No, I mean, seriously, this is this is a unique effect, right? Like, any deck that was playing Mishra's Bobble um, that wanted to get more value out of Mishra's Bobble, yes, brought back. Alex is holding up our preview card, brought back, that we just previewed because it plays well with it. And it is cool. That's totally, totally accurate. You can, you can hear the wrestling the of the excitement. Um, but what I was going to say is that deck that I took to GP San Antonio when I played uh, with, I think, Ryan and Steve um, was a deck that was doing the whole and soul artifact with like, you know, basically trying to find a way to get a lot of value out of and soul artifact on turn two and mm-hmm. Gargadons and all that cool stuff. And this card's great for that. Yeah, I mean that deck was trying to cast a, a it was trying to take advantage of playing zero one drops and it was playing um, the Chalice of the Void. Sure. And, and so like this doesn't fit totally into that exact deck, but the idea that a turn one artifact can come down and you can swing for five on turn two with your with your in soul artifact after already having drawn a card off the artifact. So they're just one for wanting you if they get rid of it. Well, and yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty strong. I mean, <laughs> not to just talk towards the snow decks also are looking for as many snow permanents as possible that like they can get in early that gain them value. So like the codal wants this in play because once you have five snow permanents in play, you can start giving a death touch. The four only it has three yeah, other. Four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, three other, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the new board wipe wants, you know, every snow permanent you have does one mi- more minus one minus one. This yep. adds to that. The new uh, Merit Liege card that brings a Merit Liege into play enchantment wants 10 snow artifacts. There are snow permanents. This is another snow permanent. Like most snow things care about how many you have. This is really cheap to get into play. Helps you fix your mana in a mana base that's already going to have problems and like kind of does everything the deck wants to do and it replaces itself. I that just... doesn't even mention all the powerful things that you can do just with the one mana cantripping artifact. I mentioned Goblin Engineer a second ago because I built a whole deck around it Mm -hmm. um, and it's cool. I actually, I talked about it on my stream uh, last night as well Um, and it's really fun. It's probably not that powerful. It's like Mardu Colors and it's trying to get Mirror Superior into play off sacrificing like Tide Hollow Sculler with a trigger on the stack and I'm not playing this card in the deck because it's three colors. Sure. If I simplified a build to be really red based and maybe two colors, you absolutely would play that card. Right. Because like that on turn one, turn two, get your good artifact in your graveyard, sack this thing to get it back, value. Right. Not to like, mention like decks like Scred. None of those decks don't want to fix mana currently, but they could pretty easily probably be smushed into a deck that's like splashing black or doing something else with it, and this helps. Um, next card, Universal Automaton. One colorless. It's a 1-1 one, one Changeling Shapelifter artifact creature. So it's just every creature ever printed, one mana for a 1-1. One, one. Um, Only reason this is relevant to talk about, I mean, I guess it's an artifact, so that's relevant as well, but like 
It's just you have now the added ability that any tribal deck has an any color one drop and any color it wants to start right. with. There's a bunch like and there's like weird ones that might want a champion or something else that just getting access to a one mana effect for a one one of that tribe can turn things on that previously didn't have the easiest time. The other thing, and we talked about this last week, is we were talking kind of about a more goblin based goblin engineer deck that's taking advantage of the both card types of right. the card and you know more of like a Kadothu red, giving all your goblins pumps with him being able to find pieces. And this is another piece to kind of help that where That's it allows you to bring stuff into your graveyard, buy them back. Um, and so that was another piece that, you know, we were looking for artifacts that you would play in the goblin Kadothu red or a goblin artificer deck. And this is definitely a, a fit for that. Also, anytime you have like a utility piece like this, that costs one as an artifact. Mm -hmm. There's not that many one mana artifact creatures. There's mm -hmm. actually re re like a relatively small number. So the way that it interacts with stuff like a trinket mage or sure. any just sort of effect, you know, your artificer's intuition, like your thing that wants to get that cheap artifact and take advantage of it, pretty strong. And and uh, I think remembering correctly, we were talking about also playing with like Goblin War Marshal or anything that make tribes cheaper. Like this could be a Memnite. Yep. With, depending on which exactly. side you're playing pretty easily. And then you start being able to do powerful things of returning it to your hand or bouncing it or doing other cool things for effect. Um, next card is Altar of Dementia. We talked about it a little bit already with the Hogak deck, but it's two colorless mana for an artifact to sacrifice a creature. Target player puts a number of cards equal to the sacrifice creature's power from the top of their library into their graveyard. This card's super powerful. Uh, this might be the most powerful reprint they printed. And it's interesting because in other formats, it's just fine because they have other artifacts that do somewhat more powerful things, but just a free sacrifice, a creature effect on a mill effect is like just so powerful. We've talked about before last week, we even talked about how the red card, the dragon that makes a dragon is the only non green yeah. or non black sacrifice outlet. This is the best artifact one and is an argument that you don't even need that red creature because you have this available to you. Right. Milling out your opponent is both a win condition and in the graveyard deck, say engine. So you like this switches from, I'm going to make my combo way more powerful immediately to I'm also going to win with it. And like, it just does so many different things. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think like we, we have talked a lot about anything from like a, um, what the, what the heck is the name of like the two mana artifact? You can sack things to like put charge counters on it, and like sure. remove them to make a two, two. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it, but, there wasn't exactly a wealth of non-creature sources to repeatedly sacrifice for no mana. Right. We just didn't have many. And so I, I don't necessarily want that effect in particular, mm -hmm. but the fact that I'm able to play it in any color for two, not three, um, very strong. Well, and, and even if you don't want this effect, eventually this just wins the game, right? Yeah, It's right. a win condition. Like, because milling a person kills a person, there are a lot of games where you're just like, oh, I win because I have enough creatures to mill you out. Um, Lesser Massacre, two artifact mana. Artifact, it's an artifact creature, two mana, Massacre. As an additional cost to cast a spell, discard a card. Lesser Massacre deals one damage to target creature, persists, it's a 2-2. Two -two. Um, it's an efficiently bodied 2-2 two -two that lets you discard a card. I don't know how powerful this is ever going to be. Training Grounds. <laughs> no, it's, it's sure. this card. <laughs> this yeah. card's fine. Uh, it does a lot. It's really cool. Like I, I do think like there are colors that might want the ability to self discard. So the one I'm thinking of is there are reanimator white lists out there yeah. that could be looking for a mono white way to get stuff into the graveyard. And this allows you to do that. And it's like a pretty hard to kill threat that does like in the late game, help you start removing things that are in your way. It's a hard to kill threat. My problem with this card in terms of talking about its real power is like, all right, so if I'm going to play this card, I could take some advantage of the persist, and I could take some advantage of wanting to discard a card. But ultimately, isn't Walking Ballista just going to be a better version of this most of the time? Like, if I want to play this alongside, like, Grand Architect, for four mana, I can dome a creature. For four mana, I can dome anything. Sure, yeah, yeah. I think, I think the four mana do a damage thing is the least important feature of this Oh, you card. just think that an efficiently bodied two mana... Persist that lets you discard a card when you cast it? as a colorless card because every, so color, every has color has access, access, to, access to, that, to it is yeah, something right. to be relevant but That's fair um moving on uh the talisman cycle so these are all cards and it, previously we had them for for uh allied colored cards now we have them for all color combos and it's basically two mana you can tap it to add one colorless mana uh to your mana pool or you can tap it to add one of two colors uh now all the color combinations are available right and it'll deal one damage to you um so this is the other variant or version of cards that we previously signets. had the signets and these are Depending on what you're doing better than the Signet, I definitely know that I really, really, really wanted a Talisman of Resilience back in the day when I was playing the uh, Tesserator list because I was trying right. to put in uh, green for Abrupt Decays right. because I needed some way to kill permanents in the deck. Um, I mean, it's like these things have always shown to be 
like Just valuable, like right on the edge of, of being playable. Um, we actually, we talk about these more for Highlander in the end than we talk about it for modern, just because like that in Highlander, you have a hundred card deck mm -hmm. and six decks. So you want to have access to more effects like this for modern where they're interesting is that they produce colorless mana. So these alongside like Eldrazi cards and things that need the colorless source, Correct. that starts to allow you to play a slightly different take with more colors alongside your pain lands to get where you need to get. And, and like, and what's interesting is in reality in Modern, the enemy colored combos are almost more powerful or more interesting as deck archetypes than the allied ones. So like Black White Eldrazi is a deck that will take advantage of Talos in the Totally. Hierarchy. I don't I don't see why, I don't know why the Black White one wouldn't see playing that deck. Uh, Talisman of Creativity, like we just talked about a, a red artificer deck, but blue red artifact decks are a thing that have been very powerful. Yeah. And this gives them a talisman, which they absolutely needed. I mentioned needing decks needing like artifact blue black decks or, or blue artifact decks needing just the ability to splash so that they can get more powerful anti uh hate cards and talisman of the resilience lets you do that so just like giving the option of being able to play these color combos is really powerful and important for these decks and i can't imagine these seeing play once in a while in modern every once in a while yeah yeah Scrapyard Recombiner, much sweeter. Three mana for an artifact creature construct. It has modular two. Uh, this creature enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it. When it dies, you may put its plus one plus one counters on art target artifact creature. It is a zero zero. You may tap it to sacrifice an artifact. Search your library for a construct card. Reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. Um, this card's really sweet. Like first off, you can cheat into play a few different ways. Like the with the what's the new elemental bird. Oh, yeah, yeah. One. You get to put with Vesperlark. Vesperlark gets us in the play, but like there's stuff like that effect. But more just like being able to sacrifice artifacts and get some really powerful constructs into your hand is like totally worth it. It can sacrifice itself. Well, right, because all of the all the good constructs, right? Like you have Ravager and you have Ballista and you have Hangerback Walker. Yeah, Hangerback um, Walker, Mem Knight, uh, Walking Ballista, Arc Bomat Ravager. Courier, Arcbound Ravager. Um, those are like the affinity small end. Scrap Keep Scrounger is one. Steel Overseer is one. Adaptive Automaton is a construct for your tribal needs. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting card. I mean, it, um, it's... Yeah. You can sack it to get one of those Metal in your Metal Worker hand. for Eternal Formats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I think this card is definitely really cool. It's one of, it's one of the most interesting... But again, I will say this. Um, it is another card that produces some value when you play it at 3 CMC... But it costing three CMC versus costing two CMC will limit its ability to be massively good in modern. Except that it does stuff when it comes in, right? Because of the way that modular works and an infinity deck works. Like if they become a deck that wants to grind out more, especially with hardened scales, the fact that this can come down as a four four that then puts those counters onto other creatures when it dies, but even it, if they get rid of it. You can't sack itself the turn it comes down. Yeah. Oh, sure. It has but the tap. So but it's still a three mana four four or three mana two two that if it dies or chump blocks, you still gain value off of it. Yeah, and I think this card is awesome. I yeah. think I more mean like Season Pyromancer comes down and does something. So does this. So does the the Arranger Captain of Eos, right? Like a lot of these new cards, they cost three and they're good, but the fact that they are Slightly bigger versions, like turn, spins on cards that we sure. had that cost two. The idea is to advance those cards, right? Like the idea is yeah, this yeah. is a slightly bigger, slightly different Arcman Ravager. Or you have a slightly bigger season, you know, young Pyromancer. Now it's a seasoned Pyromancer. Sure. So changing the cost on it makes it that you're going to have to work a little harder to make this card work in your deck. But I oh, do but think like it's really cool. Of the three cards you listed, two of them have already seen extreme play in Modern since Modern Horizons has come out. I mean, I like all of these cards. So <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, I, I do think this card will see play. Sure. Um, I just wonder, yeah, I wonder how much. Uh, and now, last two cards for the set review. <laughs> Took us like six and a half hours. Ooh, all right. They are Sword of Sinew and Steel and Sword and Truth of Justice. Uh, the Sword Cycle. We have now got Ally Swords. Why isn't Stolen Forge Mystic in the format? Three mana, artifact equipment. Uh, I'm doing sword and sinew and steel first. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus two, and has protection from black and from red. Whenever a cre equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, destroy up to one target planeswalker and uh, up to one target artifact. Equipped two. This is the most value of these two swords. I think yeah. this one's like very specific, but also like right now, killing artifacts and planeswalkers is pretty relevant in modern. Yeah. Uh, right now, giving protection from black and red is the best two protections you can get in modern. Um, Ish. White would be close, but... Yeah, but this gains more value than any of the white protections ones, right? Because, like, white-black is pretty medium. 
value, like gaining life, who cares? Rebuying a creature is pretty medium. The I mean, the, this I mean, in the way that in the way that body and mind is the worst because blue and green are the least significant to be protected against. This well, but, is really good in that in that comparison. Sure, and the protection side it's very powerful. And then I do think killing a planeswalker in modern right now is like super relevant. Like there's a ton of yeah yeah, yeah. like like knocking out an Arset or, or a Karn or any right. of these things. If you, you know if you're able to play this and and connect with it, I just think. They definitely took the power level of the swords and they they shifted them down for these two. They definitely don't feel as like, I mean, I guess they're more they're more specific is the thing. So like, yes. if, if fire and ice is just your classically good, I'm drawing a card and I'm dealing damage. This is not that. This is something a lot more complex. I think these. I think this one is comparable to shadow and light and shadow. I okay. think. I think if if the god tier is sword, uh, fire and ice, fire and ice, and feast and famine. Like those are the best right. two, uh, and the bottom is body and mind. Right, well, body and mind has seen legacy play totally. Uh, <laughs> being able to get through Jace's and Tarmogoyf's is good, <laughs> um, uh, and War and Peace I would say is probably comparable to body and mind. Right, um, where both of them are really only ever playable in any format historically. If those color protections are important, their like actual effects are medium. Right. Um, I would say this is closer to Light and Shadow, like Dead in the Middle, and maybe better than Light and Shadow. Most, I would. I have more reasons to play this than Light and Shadow because of as a hate card against artifacts. Like these, these the two swords feel like these are much more printings, just for like for people to have fun with. Because no swords really see much play in modern anyway. Until Stoneforge Mystic is unbanned. Yeah, yeah. unbanned Stoneforge Mystic. It feels like at this point they. Could. It's so silly that it's not unbanned. Like. And everyone's like, oh, but it'll hate on creature decks. And I'm like, no, Hogak attacking you on turn three with an 8-8 yeah. trample, it hates on your creature deck. Right. Like, the fact that Teferi makes it so you no longer get to play the game ever again hates on your creature deck. Right. Like, that Karn makes it so you no longer get to cast mana ever again hates on your creature deck. Stoneforge Mystic would let you get under those cards and be able to put a threat into play to be able to attack them. Yeah. I mean, Unbanned I, Stoneforge Mystic. <laughs> yeah, like a 4-4 four, four lifelinking end of turn on turn three is like... Pretty good. I, and, like, <laughs> I, like, understood Aaron Forthlight's argument that, like, Blue-White Control was one of the best decks last year in yep. Modern. So, like, why would we give it more power level? And then they printed the three-mana Teferi and Narset into Modern, where, like, Narset Puzzle Box is now a thing that Blue-White Control gets to do. There's, like, 15... <laughs> Let Stoneblade exist. There's, like, 15 <laughs> new, like, unbelievably powerful things you can do in Modern. So much so that, like, my dumb brewing now feels more akin to the dumb brewing I was doing in 2011 because I feel so outclassed by what's happening in Modern. Right. It took me a few years to catch up, and finally I was at a place where, like, I could come up with ideas that were, like, kind of competitive. Now, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll, like, loop this to get a 5-6 into play. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you're already dead. Well, it's, it's like, people are asking me for dope Kess lists. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, Kogak exists. Uh, yeah. Karn exists. <laughs> um, the so last yeah. card uh, Sword and Truth and Justice Three mana Equip creature Gets plus two plus two And protection from white And from blue Relevant against the All the things We were just talking about uh, Whenever equipped creature Deals combat damage To a player Put a plus one plus one Counter on a creature You control Then proliferate uh, Equipped two So This is maybe The hardest to evaluate The front end Is like pretty medium Though fine, I'm putting a plus one plus one counter and proliferate is so swinging on how valuable it is, as we know. Um, I think this card's pretty powerful. I'll play it in my Highlander decks because I play with a lot of. I have a Geist deck, or not a Highlander, Commander deck, um, yeah. where Geist plays with this and gets to loop it with his all the Planeswalkers that are in the deck. Um, blue Eye Control, like if I hit with this in a Blue Eye Control deck, that's a lot of value. Like taking my Narset up, my Teferi up, my other Teferi up, and my Jace up is right. like. A lot of loyalty for doing damage to someone. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I, this card. I mean, I, I was. They were probably the two mythics that I w had the biggest like swing back on my actual excitement for their power level. Not because I don't think they're powerful. I just like I have tried to build decks that take advantage of swords and modern a lot, mm -hmm. and these don't get me super excited to do that. So they'll probably be cards that I'll end up using for other purposes that are sweet. But. Uh, yeah, that's going to wrap us up on the set review, guys. Yep. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Wizards, for the free preview card for those who didn't. Thank you, Wizards, for the free preview card for those who didn't get to see it. Brought back. Brought Super back. dope. Uh, and see you guys next week. Yeah, I uh, hope you guys enjoy GP Seattle. We'll be back with some non-set review content pretty soon. And be sure to check out the YouTube channel and subscribe and all the things so that you can see us going live every single week. I'm going to go at least once a week, and I think Alex is going to start doing it too. Yep. We're really excited about it. Yep. Thanks yep. for listening, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you for your attention. See you later, alligator. This has been a production of Time Traveler Media, sending podcasts into the future.